Paul Thigpen wrote this. I remember coming home one afternoon to discover that the kitchen I had worked so hard to clean only a few hours before was now a terrible wreck. My young daughter had obviously been cooking, and the ingredients were scattered along with dirty bowls and utensils across the counters and floor. I was not happy with the situation. Then, as I looked a little more closely at the mess, I spied a tiny note on the table, clumsily written and smeared with chocolatey fingerprints. The message was short. I'm making something for you, Dad. And it was signed, Your Angel. In the midst of that disarray, and despite my irritation, joy suddenly sprang up in my heart, sweet and pure. My attention had been redirected from the problem to the little girl I loved. As I encountered her in that brief note, I delighted in her. With her simple goodness and focus, I could take pleasure in seeing her hand at work in a situation that seemed otherwise disastrous. The same is true of my joy in the Lord. Many times life looks rather messy. I can't find much to be happy about in my circumstances. Nevertheless, if I look hard enough, I can usually see the Lord behind it all, or at least working through it all, making something for me. I want to uh, begin our study today in the Psalms and a reading from the 48th Psalm, a few verses at the beginning and then at the close of that Psalm. So verses 1 through 3 of Psalm 48, then we'll skip down to verse 9. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. As your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth, your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go around her. Number her towers. Consider well her ramparts. Go through her citadels that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God, forever and ever. He will guide us forever. Well, this is a, a worship psalm. It's a song of joy, and it celebrates the greatness of God, and it celebrates the holy city, Jerusalem, the city of the great king, as it's called. Many students think that it reflects pretty well the the uh, activities of Nehemiah chapter 12, uh, which we come to today in, in this session. And uh, I hope we'll learn something about the importance of joy and where it comes from and how it should be a defining characteristic of the people of God. Uh, we're just going to have this lesson and then one more in the series which has turned into a lengthy one from the book of Nehemiah. This is the 12th session, and uh, there'll be just one more after this. But we've entitled this series, Let Us Rise Up and Build. And, of course, the great building project of Nehemiah's day were the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, these walls had laid in ruins for more than a century, and then... With the blessing of God and the leadership of Nehemiah and with the willingness of the people who had a mind to work, they restored the walls of the holy city. Chapter 12 tells us how they celebrated their completion of their work. 
And basically, the way they did so was uh, to worship God. Uh, if you look at chapter 12 of Nehemiah, verse 27, you'll notice three important words in that verse that I want to highlight. That verse says, And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgivings, and with singing, with cymbals, harps, and lyres. The three words to highlight are celebrate, thanksgiving, and dedication. Those are really three things that true worship does, if you think about it. To celebrate is to praise or to honor something, to ascribe worth to something. It's said that in Rome, ancient Rome, when, it, when a great champion won a contest in the arena, that the crowd would chant, Axios, Axios, which translated as worthy, worthy. Um, you may mo be more familiar with the modern equivalent of that in sports when fans sort of do that, that mock bow to an athlete after they make a great play and they say, we're not worthy, we're not worthy, that kind of thing. Uh, they were more serious about it in Rome. Um, the heavenly worship, uh, for instance, in the book of Revelation, it's described in this way. Revelation chapters 4 and 5, the worshiper says, Worthy are you, O Lord. That's what celebration is. It's, it's giving worth to, it's praising, it's honoring. And then there's thanksgiving. Uh, that is expressing gratitude to God for his great gifts to us. It's a central part of worship. Again, that's found in the heavenly worship that's described in the vision of Revelation, the giving of thanks. And then the third word in this verse is dedication. It's actually the word in Hebrew that we eventually get Hanukkah from. You've heard of Hanukkah. Uh, but long before that became a Jewish holiday, you see, it was an essential part of the worship of God, and it still is. Well, what is it? It is an offering of something to God, some, some effort, some object, or even more importantly, it's an offering of oneself dedicating oneself to God. You really don't render true worship if you don't dedicate something to God. Uh, you might think of the verse in the New Testament, Romans chapter 12, the first verse, where it's written, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That's really what we mean by dedication. Well, in Nehemiah's day, they dedicated the wall of Jerusalem that they had poured their blood, sweat, and tears into. They dedicated it to God. They worshipped, you see. They, they celebrated they gave thanks, and they dedicated. And those are three things that all true worship does. But we also learn in this particular chapter the, the attitude, the spirit with which all true worship is done. This comes a little later in the chapter in verse 43. It says there, and they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. So the attitude of worship 
is joyful. The, the spirit of the worshiper is one that rejoices. In, uh, in these two verses that, that we're focusing on today from this chapter, verse 27 and now verse 43, the word for joy or rejoicing is used five times in these two verses. It's used once in the 27th verse and then four times in verse 43. And so there in verse 43, for instance, it says, And they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. I love especially that last phrase, their joy was heard far away. Folks, when, when God's people truly worship, when we celebrate and give thanks and dedicate ourselves, and when we, we do it all in the context of joy, we truly influence the world. It is indeed heard far away. And you see, we're talking here about so much more than just about the songs that we sing or the style with which we sing them or what the worship space looks like or how we use technology, all those things that, that uh, often we're tied up in and maybe too much occupied with. If we'll just accomplish true worship, that is celebration, thanksgiving, dedication, and all with a spirit of joy, our world will notice. It will be heard far away. Well, that day in Jerusalem, they did an interesting thing. Um, sort of describing it rather than reading it from the, the text. They divided the people into two groups of worshipers. And picture this, they, they rebuilt and built these walls they go up on top of the walls of Jerusalem, divided into two, two groups, and literally stand on top of the walls. And with Nehemiah at the head of one group and Ezra at the head of the other, they march on top of the walls. Nehemiah's group goes in one direction. Ezra's group goes in the opposite direction. And so they marched. And they sang, and they celebrated, and they worshipped. And eventually, it says that they met together at the temple and, and worshipped in a unified group. That uh, conclusion is in verse 40 of chapter 12. Imagine that scene. What a scene that must have been, and no wonder they were heard far away. I wonder if old Tobiah heard them. You say, who's that? You remember Tobiah, that name in this, in this book? You have to go back to chapter 4. He was one of the main enemies that uh, opposed the work of rebuilding the wall. And you remember as they began working, uh, as the workers got started, there were some who stood around and laughed at them and, and scolded and scorned them, mocked them. And Tobiah was among that number that's named. He was one of those scoundrels who did everything he could to discourage the work. In fact, it tells us what Tobiah shouted at the workers. He said, this is chapter 4, verse 4 of Nehemiah, he said, Yeah, what they're building, if even a little fox crawls up on it, it would crumble their sorry wall. But on this particular bright day in Jerusalem, hundreds of people walked on top of that wall, praising the God who had helped them build it. So enemies can say hurtful things. They can say whatever they want. But in the end, 
If God is involved in the work and blessing it, the enemies won't be laughing. The pessimists won't be heard from. All that will be heard will be the songs of the redeemed. One of my favorite worship songs takes its words actually from the book of Nehemiah, believe it or not. Uh, it comes from an earlier chapter than we're studying today. It comes from chapter 8, where the people, they're assembled on another occasion, and they're hearing the word of God read to them by Ezra. You remember that? And uh, one of the things that Ezra says to them uh, relates to this theme. It's Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. He says to them, Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Twyla Paris took that piece of scripture and wrote the following lyrics that may be familiar to you. She wrote, The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter. I will not faint. He is my shepherd. I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. He will uphold me all of my days. I am surrounded by mercy and grace, and the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength, and I will not waver walking by faith. He will be strong to deliver me safe, and the joy of the Lord is my strength. That really was the case for the citizens of the holy city. If you look once more at verse 43, notice that the subject of that sentence is God. God, it says, made them rejoice with great joy. They didn't manufacture their own joy. Sometimes we try to do that. But God gave it to them. So, folks, if you want more joy, ask God, who gives generously to everybody who asks in faith. You know, every good gift comes from God. Joy is a good thing. It's a great thing. And if we want more joy uh, when we come together, let's pray for it. When's the last time we prayed for something like joy? God gives joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Joy should be the context in which we operate as the people of God, and it certainly should be the context in which we worship that God. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Remember that? There was preacher who was leading a sort of short-term mission trip, they actually had gone to the island of Tobago in the Caribbean. And you might look at that and say, yeah, what a place to go for a mission trip, the Caribbean. But this particular group had gone to a village where the only people uh, who lived there were lepers. Uh, there was no luxury on this trip. So the, the evangelist was preaching, and he was actually leading some singing, leading some worship singing. And uh, as he was doing so, a woman in this small crowd of villagers who had been facing away from the front the entire time turned around. The preacher said, it was the most hideous face I had ever seen. The woman's nose and ears were entirely gone. She lifted a hand with no fingers high into the air and asked, Can we sing, Count Your Many Blessings? He was overcome with emotion. And he had to leave the service. 
one of the mission team members followed him and, and said, I, I guess you won't be able to sing that song anymore. To which he replied, yes, I will, but I'll never sing it the same way again. See, that's what happens when worship is true. When we, like the people that Nehemiah worked with, celebrate and give thanks and dedicate ourselves, the God of heaven will give us joy. And that joy of the Lord will be our strength. And it will be a joy heard round the world. So, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. God bless you.